uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I've learned about Aries uh, uh, recently. I'm a relatively recent ham. I just got my t well. It'll in September. It'll be a year since I got my, my got my ticket. But uh, I've been uh, been learning a lot about it, and it's a it's an interesting thing. So let's uh, start off. Uh, first of all, one of the things is that uh, let's see. Uh, one of the questions that sometimes sometimes comes up is. There's Aries and their races, and what's the difference between them, and how are they linked together, and so forth. Well, Virginia, for Virginia, that turns, about, turns out to be a pretty easy thing. Basically, there is no distinction. The, the races, uh, uh, the independent races organization in Virginia got to be such a mess that they basically just said that if uh, they want to activate uh, uh, races, then the Aries uh, units just become uh, just become races. Uh, that gives them the ability to do things like, in the case of an emergency when ham radio would normally shut down, then uh, we can under races we can still communicate, but only with other races stations, things like that. Uh, so when I'm talking about this, I, we're, I'm going to be talking about Aries, but races is sort of there in the background for it. Uh, now, this is a, a statement we've all seen. When all else failed, amateur radio works. Okay, and I got the question for you. Why? Why is it that when all else fails, amateur radio works? Somebody, anybody have, a, have an idea? Well, no stinking infrastructure. Well, okay, no, no, st no stinking infrastructure was not exactly on my list. But uh, <laughs> any, any other, any other sort of We're suggestion? Good at cobbling stuff together. Okay, good at, good at cobbling stuff together. What else? We practice. Okay, we, we practice. Uh, training is a, is a big part of it. Uh, what, uh, what else? We'll look for any excuse to get on the air. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, lo lo love to talk. We're, we're going to talk about that later under the training part. Uh, I think synchronization is part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I see. Yeah. We, we, usually, we usually have emergency power that can go anywhere. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you covered I, I put together my list there, uh, and, I, uh, and you... You, most of these were covered there. There's lots of hams. There's, there's a lot of us out there, so they can't kill us all. Uh, they, they've got, uh, 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 you know, we've got lots of ways to talk. We talk with it. We use a type of power that's relatively easy to get. Any, any car battery can keep us going if we need to. Uh, and, and again, sort of the, the, the training and sort of the knowledge part of it there are, are a big, big part of that. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about in the, the talk is a little bit about emergencies, because what I want you to be thinking about is what should Aries be doing to be prepared for emergencies? That's what we're there for. What should we be prepared for? I'll talk a little bit about uh, Aries operations, the skills, some of the training types of things. I'll talk a little bit about the structure of Virginia Aries and talk about sort of some of the challenges, some of the competitors that we have in terms of providing <coughs> emergency services. So, uh, yeah, and this, uh, that's my slide just basically saying I'd like you to think about those things as we're, as we're doing it. John, are you going to cover what CERT is? Uh, I, yeah, so there's a there's a search slide forthcoming in the in the in the lecture there. Uh, uh, disasters do happen here, and I want to thank uh, Jerry K8OG back there for the uh, for this because I did not happen to have a copy of the Daily Progress from 1969 sitting on my shelf. Uh, and uh, uh, this was, uh, was Hurricane Camille that dumped 27 inches of rain in a 24-hour period and killed between 150 and 160 people in, uh, in Nelson County, okay? Uh, you know, and that's, that's local. And all of the geologists tell us that those sorts of storms in the foothills of the Blue Ridge are something that happens again and again over time. We saw a little bit of that. Uh, anybody remember when, uh, when the 
when 29 North uh, at the uh, Madison Green County line was completely underwater, that bridge that you normally lean over and look there, they had a similar thing where a thunderstorm came in and just sat there for a couple hours and all of a sudden we had a, had a flood. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was quite a mess. Uh, anyway, so what I did was I, I put, uh, put together sort of a, a, a chart here that sort of shows uh, on the bottom is sort of how likely it is that something's going to happen. How often is it going to happen? And then on, this, on the vertical axis here, I've got just how bad is it? And so, you know, we expect <coughs> things like, uh, you know, uh, power outages, we see power outages you know, practically every day during the summer, uh, you know, some place has a power outage due to a thunderstorm. Uh, you know, winter storms, major winter storms, uh, uh, hurricanes, flooding, major hurricanes, and then we get up into the, the sort of the real uh, wrath of God type of, uh, type of area where you've got, you know, the, a major earthquake, nuclear attacks, just where terrorists fall into this, I don't know. They're, they they probably can, they, they, who knows, they may disrupt my power. Who knows, they, they may be doing something more major there. Another real question mark there is sort of where, where cyber war and hackers might fall in here. I mean, if you want to talk about things that could take down our infrastructure, probably uh, one of the ones you most need to worry about is, uh, is some organized group that gets in and really does a serious job taking out the power system and also compromises the communication systems, okay? The lack of centralization in ham radio probably means that we're relatively safe from that, uh, it, though our logging software might be in grave danger of not working. Everybody's got a pencil. <laughs> yeah. So what do we have in our... Uh, in our arsenal to sort of address this. So I've color coded a little bit here. We've got our UHF, VHF, we've got our, uh, our uh, HF, and then we've also got, uh, thanks to, to Mike, we're doing some things with microwave uh, uh, spread spectrum packet types of things as well. So what I did was went through and sort of color coded that chart to try to uh, 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 see what type of communications mode is most likely to be critical there. And uh, although what uh, we focus on a lot is the UHF, VHF stuff, that's useful sort of in this area of the graph. Once you start getting up into some of these areas, all of a sudden maybe UHF, VHF is not going to do the job for you. You're going to need to be using HF to get actually get out of the area. In the case of the sort of the prime example of this that everybody looks at is Hurricane Katrina, okay? Hurricane Katrina, it wasn't just a question that the local repeaters were down. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was, you know, so they, a lot of the things they were having to do there were, were in terms of bringing in HF rigs to, to do uh, uh, NVIS uh, uh, near vertical uh, radiation patterns that could get them out three or four hundred miles in a fairly reliable way uh, from places like Red Cross centers and, and things like that. So those are, you know, sort of a sort of a the big view of the types of things. Now, one of the challenges that we have, of course, is that it's relatively easy to train for these, and these are also ones that we're really likely to have them. You know, they're, they're will probably be one of these types of incidents in the next couple years that we will be asked to do. We had one last year, we'll probably have one next year. But the thing is that we need to be prepared not only to address those, but we also need to be prepared to deal with things like this. And these might not occur for a very long time. Hopefully they'll never occur in the lifetime of anybody here. But if they do, what are we going to do about it? So, so that's sort of that, uh, that question is in terms of preparing for emergencies, where should we be putting our efforts in terms of, uh, in terms of the preparation on the stuff that's really likely to happen or the stuff that's probably won't happen but could? That, those, are, those are sort of the questions there.
So I will be interested in sort of hearing your, your feedback a little bit on, on what sorts of roles you think we should be focusing on. Uh, because like I say there, my crystal ball is out for calibration. I can't tell you when the next earthquake is going to hit <laughs> and what it's going to look like when it does. But even mineral has substantial damage about five years ago. Right. That's less than 50 miles east of us. Yeah, yeah, no, and then the thing is that it's, the thing with earthquakes is that uh, there are certain places where, yeah, if you're in California, probably earthquakes will probably move, move down that graph considerably to the left. But the, uh, you know, but there are major faults that run under mineral. The, the, there's actually one, I think, that runs under New York. And I mean, the biggest earthquake I think they've had in the continental United States was, I think, Missouri. Uh, fortunately, it was at a time when, when not many people lived there. But uh, anyway, those are, just because we haven't had earthquakes doesn't mean we can't have earthquakes. But anyway, be, be sort, of, sort of thinking about that. Um, now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the Charlottesville, Albemarle, UVA, Aries. Um, we have about 20 members. About 50% uh, of them are amateur extras, 20% technician, which my advanced mathematical training tells me there's about 30% generals uh, in there. Uh, we're part of uh, uh, Virginia Aries District 3. And we uh, do have the, uh, the, actually, the district emergency coordinator is with us. Uh, Jeff, if you want to raise your hand. And <laughs> there, there he is. Uh, he's, the, the dis he's in charge of all of this. Uh, and uh, the, the, the leadership of the local Aries group is me. And then I also immediately, upon taking, taking power, asked Mike to serve as assistant emergency coordinator, mainly to focus on uh, continuing his work on those mesh digital networks that he's been, been working on. Um, and uh, the uh, Albemarle Group serves as the net control station for the, uh, the uh, NPEN, the Northern Piedmont Emergency Net, on the first Monday of each month. Obviously, the net occurs on all the other Mondays, so please, okay. please Thursday. check. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday. Yes, no, Monday's the information net. Thursday is the uh, thing. I did have it right on the slide. Um, now, in terms of local Aries infrastructure, we do actually have some pre-positioned equipment. Okay, so we do have at the Emergency Communications Center, an antenna and a radio, at Martha Jefferson Hospital, antenna and radio, uh, at the Red Cross, uh, we've got an antenna and radio, and in other places uh, like uh, UVA Zemer Hall or Western Albemarle High School, we have pre-positioned antennas but no actual radios already in place there. Uh, and all of these are VHF, UHF. Uh, one important one to, to keep in mind here is that we do also have a, that a WinLink 2000, uh, your ham radio email uh, thing. By the way, how many people here have, have used uh, WinLink or, or, okay, so it's a, a relatively modest number there. It's an interesting, interesting technology. Um, and also, how many people have ever sent, a, sent or received a, a digital message over VHF? Okay, so that, that's uh, sort of the same people, but, uh, but a, a maybe a little bit uh, larger number there. Now, the reason that I bring that up is because, of course, when you're working on emergency situations, you have two kinds of messages. You've got the sort of message that you can just easily exchange over, uh, over phone uh, that's an informal message, but sometimes there are things that are important enough that they really need to be documented and they need to be, you know, somebody gives you the piece of paper and you send it exactly like it's written down. Well, sending it by voice is pretty cumbersome. It's really, so having the digital capability there is a, a real nice thing to have. But anyway, I just sort of point out that, uh, that wind link repeater that's just right up at the top of the hill here. You're missing a few. Say again? You're missing uh, a few. Uh, that are, okay. Pre-positioned. Pre-positioned. Uh, uh, now, all of Crozet covered. Western yeah. Animal Rescue Squad, Fire Department. Okay. The, uh, uh, Animal uh, County Police Department. Um, okay. I, I, I went with the book that I had, so I need to talk to you. There are 14 of them. 
14 of them, okay. 14 prepositioned antennas in Albemarle County. Okay. They're part of race, uh, Aries, all of them put up by this club. Yeah. Okay. You know, Except the pros A ones I helped See, that's, up. we just discussed this yeah. at one board meeting. There's a little confusion there because is it owned by our club or is it owned yeah. by Aries? But we need to document that. Yeah, we, we. They were, they were put up. The money was put up by our club, but it was a club donation to the Aries <laughs> Okay, that's okay. So they really, really should belong to Aries. That's great. Okay. Well, one of one of the things that I, that I will Did talk. You work with Jim offline. Yeah, no, I, I will definitely work with Jim offline. And the other thing, also, is to tell you the truth. Also, the documentation on a lot of these things is is a little long in the tooth. So it would be really good to get some people out who perhaps already have relationships with some of these institutions in order to, uh, to, 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 to update that survey and also put it in a more, more electronic form. We right now it's in a notebook. If Jim was to get hit by a Mack truck or Meteor, knowing yeah. that it's, it's a Crozet rescue squad, there might not be anyone around who knows where the coax is, right? It might be nice to test it yeah. to make sure it's all working. Yeah. We, we should have some kind of a periodic inspection. <laughs> and when Dave was doing this, he used to do it about every six months. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not the only one who has this list. Dave, Dave, right. Dave yeah. participated in the installation of every one of those. We have to know where the PL259 is. Yeah. It's a disaster because um, Jim Owen was sent to Monticello High School on one of the tests. Yeah. He never found the antenna, or did you? <laughs> you eventually found it. I was sent to the county police department. I never found the antenna, <laughs> but I worked very well with just my handheld. Yeah. Now I know where that antenna is because it drops out of the ceiling right on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is information it sounds like that needs to be put in a communications plan under Aries, yes. right. so that Aries leadership at all levels is aware of all these locations yeah. so that we can pre-plan accordingly depending on what the situation is that we're called out. I'm not reading that. Right. Real, yeah, I, yeah, I do have a, a, a notebook that actually came by way of Dave Damon through a couple of steps there, and it does not have a lot of those antennas in it. So, so maybe you pick up the phone and talk to between Dave yeah. and Jim. Right. We, we need to, Jim, I think, I think we do need to update that database for sure. You had another question back there? No, no. I was Perfect. just going to say, the very first thing I did after I got my license, Dave handed me the microphone and we did that test on a Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon. Okay. And I was thinking there were 22 that we, sites that we had. Did you I actually have? go back and look? Okay. Could be, but my list has 14. 14. Okay. Well, my, my list obviously is fewer than that, so we'll, we'll do it. Uh, one of the uh, uh, other sort of resources out there is the, uh, the uh, local emergency services organizations are, have basically gone digital in terms of uh, the uh, Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. And so what they have is this uh, a website called v VOC or Viasi or you, anybody have a better pronunciation for that? Viachi. 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 Okay. Uh, I knew there was one I was missing. Uh, anyway, uh, basically this takes sort of almost a social media approach to sharing information about, uh, about emergencies. And it's also something that uh, is, is best used if you've had some training in it, okay? Just coming into this cold, it's, it can be a pretty <laughs> bewildering place to be. Uh, now, that gets into, into sort of Aries operations. And what I've done is sort of listed the, the skills that we need and sort of where they fall. I'm not gonna sort of read through this list for you. But we basically have, you know, the ham skills. These are things that hopefully we've got already, okay? But we also need to have these emergency skills. If we're going to be working in an emergency services environment, we have to know what an emergency services environment looks like and how it works and what the expectations are and things like that. And then finally, because it can mean working away from home for 
sometimes substantial periods of time, you also need those, those I call them scout skills, that ability to forge your way through the wilderness, to sleep in places that weren't designed for sleeping, to eat things that were never designed to be eaten, <laughs> or, at least, or at least not in that form. I mean, uh, cold, cold, cold pizza and beans out of the can come to mind. Uh, anyway, th those types of things, uh, things there. But being, working with Aries doesn't just mean having the ham skills. It means having the whole package. Um, now, historically, Aries was about communications only. Okay, if you were called up to do communications, you could be expected to be in a back room and people would bring in pieces of paper for you to send, to transmit to other stations, to exchange the information back and forth. The environment has changed a bit. And so right now, they're talking more in terms of having ARIES operators do tasks that include communication. So you might have jobs other than simply passing the messages uh, back and forth. That's in part because there's now sort of a wider range of sort of communication technologies out there. And sometimes we're not the only, only uh, uh, person in the game there. And that also, again, places a new premium on training because, again, if you're going to be expected to do something else as well as run radios, you better darn well know how to do something else. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the incident command system. Okay, this is uh, the, the, the system that's being used by emergency services organizations. It really had its birth on September 11, 2001 because very bad things happened in New York in terms of confused organizations working at cross purposes. Uh, anyway, they realized that the, the old silos of here's the fire people, here's the police, here's the, uh, here's the radio people wasn't working. Okay, so they went back and uh, built a system that focuses, again, on establishing and achieving well-defined objectives. This is management by objectives. The first thing that happens when you do, uh, when uh, an in the incident command system is, is, uh, is activated is that somebody comes up with the plan and that plan starts off by saying, what are our objectives? What is it we're trying to do? Okay, so that's, that's from the, the, the very start. And it needs to be a, something that's a fairly flexible system. I'll talk about this later because this is something that needs to work for the smallest incident and also for the largest incident. Now, this is the organization chart for, uh, for it. I'm not going to spend sort of a huge amount of time on it except to note that at the top there's one box. Okay, that box is the incident commander. Now, in some cases that might be what they call a a, a unified command, in which case this, this box might actually be filled by people in a room who are acting together to command the, the thing. This is usually in complex incidents of where you have different uh, uh, federal organizations that have different responsibilities. But for us, what it means is there's an incident commander. Uh, they have certain people to support them in terms of, uh, of, of, of public affairs. This is, what, this is the part that talks to the press. Typically, as an amateur radio operator, your job is not to be talking to the press, okay? They've got somebody to do that for you. Uh, and then below that, we have the, the different sections. The, the big the, the big kahuna here is the operations section. I mean, that's the section that actually goes out and sends people to the emergency scene, that actually is running ambulances back and forth and that sort of thing. But important in there is also the planning section to make sure that the, that, uh, that in information that is received from the field is incorporated into plans, that you have an idea as to, to what's going to happen. The logistics section, which takes care of supporting all of these things. And then finally, we've got the sort of the finance and administration section. Because if you're dealing, if your incident happens to be a forest fire and you're employing 500 paid firefighters, well, they probably want to actually get paid. So the, that financial section can be uh, important for that. 
Uh, now, like I said, this is a flexible structure. I showed you this big, big organizational chart, but the thing is, for most incidents, most of these uh, uh, entire sections or, or perhaps the entire chart are made up by one person. It may very well be, you know, I've got that as an example that for a small incident, the whole organization is one, one person. It's the, you know, if, if, if a, a police officer is responding to a minor traffic accident, he's the whole, whole, whole organizational chart. Uh, for lots of other types of incidents, uh, they may, uh, the incident commander may appoint a section chief and, and activate the operations section. Or for bigger ones, they, they may, uh, they may uh, activate additional ones. So the idea is that, uh, that this is a system that can work for small things and can also work for big things. Okay. Should work for, for small things and for big things. We all know that when something, when you have big catastrophes, keeping anything together is hard. And so th th that's why it's important to have that structure that keeps it together so people understand what their relationship is. So that being the case, where are hams in this? <laughs> Okay, uh, well, oh, excuse me, let me just, uh, I've got a, another diagram that shows where hams are, but I'll let you think about it for a second. Uh, what, relative to communications, the, the incident command system emphasizes clear plain language communications. Okay, because they were running into all sorts of problems because it turns out that the police 10 signals were meant different things than the police 10 signals. So one of them would say, what's your 1020? And the other one's going, you've got a tornado. Uh, <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, uh, so uh, they, they, they de-emphasize strongly the use of, of uh, Especially in voice communications, uh, 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 pro signs, abbreviations, any sort of a, sort of a, a coding thing that would keep somebody who was perhaps not familiar with a particular community's conventions to, to work with it. Uh, and then also emphasizes use of standard phonetics, and I'll talk more about them later, and also sort of the distinctions between formal and informal communications, and I'll talk about those later as well. <coughs> So this is where the hams are in the organization. Basically, the, the main place where communications lives is over in the logistics section, and there's actually a communications unit. So this will be the unit that will be responsible for organizing and deploying communications. Now, that being the case, it may be that you actually do have people sort of going out into the field as part of a, a task force or strike team. One of them is a team made up of, you might have a, uh, a strike team that consisted of five ham radio operators that were going off to do something. And the other one is a task force is one of where you actually are combining different things. So it's a radio operator plus an EMT plus a, a driver, whatever would constitute a, a force there. So it's, it's possible that hams could then be deployed sort of in, in that area. Um, now, the, uh, like I say, the purpose of ICS is to try to impose some sort of order on a, an inherently disordered situation. Okay, so it's going to be defining who's responsible, okay? Who, get, who makes decisions in particular places? Uh, who's got control? Who can, who can, who's in command? Who says what you should or shouldn't do? Uh, one of the things that's imp an important element to it is that if you are deployed under the ICS, you don't worry about five supervisors that you answer to. You answer to a supervisor, okay? And, and this one sort of surprised me, is they recommend that three to seven people, so no supervisor should be trying to manage 20 people, okay? It, because what's going to happen if you try to manage 20 people? Somebody's going to get lost, okay? So the recommendation actually is more in the three to five range. Seven is, is the stretching it part. Uh, 
And then, uh, and then one of the things that's also part of the, the ICS uh, training is that there's all sorts of naming conventions. If somebody says somebody's a chief, that immediately tells you where they are in the org chart, if you know, if you've had that training. Uh, and, uh, and those have distinctions that, uh, that are very useful in terms of rapidly conveying information about, uh, about, uh, about where you are, what's happening in terms of the, the, the infrastructure there. Uh, now, uh, training. There, uh, for ICS training, there's a number of, uh, of online courses that are available for free through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. How many of you have, have, have taken one or more of these courses? Okay. Did you find it to be the most exciting thing you'd ever done in your life? <laughs> Not so much. Okay. So, but you, 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 you can get through it. You can get your certificates. You can get... Uh, get this done. They're, these are not. These are by no means painful. If anything, it's the fact that they have made them so that they are uh, pitched at a level where uh, any intelligent person should be able to, to go through them. And they and then they shaded it down a little bit more. <laughs> uh, anyway, but it's the, the 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 so the so when you go online, don't expect to be going. Oh wow, this is the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. But in the end, it's still worth it. And what they will do is they will actually give you back a certificate that says that you have uh, have passed that. Um, the, I've highlighted the two that are sort of the most critical ones. These others are also useful. And there are actually a number of other ones uh, as well. And I've gone through all four of these, so it, 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 it can be done. Uh, they take, a, take about uh, maybe two hours each to, each to go through. So I'd recommend taking a look at them because the incident con command system isn't going anywhere. It's going to be here for a long time. Uh, there, there may be some adaptations to it, but, but mostly I was pretty struck by the fact that it's a pretty well thought out system. Now, there's lots of places in there where there are arbitrary decisions where you could have done it this way or you could have done it that way. But the thing that's most important is that we know about the same way of doing it. Because otherwise, because if everybody came in and designed their own ICS, it would look different. And it would sure work different, too, if we all came in and tried to run those at the same time. So it's, it's I, I'm going to, uh, 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 Jeff here is a, is, a big, uh, is a big proponent of training, and I'm going to second him on that. This is a, a good thing to look at. But it's not just ICS training, okay? There's also available, and I had promised Ed I would, would throw this in, <coughs> is there's also, uh, remember I talked about the box that was sort of the emergency services side of things. <coughs> there is also the Community Emergency Response Team, CERT. And they are basically designed to help prepare community members to participate in emergency responses. Um, they offer two levels of training, okay? The first level of training is really, uh, Sort of, it's it's focused on the person. It's making sure that you're safe, that you're prepared, uh, that has you know the elements of, of fire safety, elements of medical opera, uh, of medical operations, some idea. But it's a three-hour course. You take it once. Okay. They list three dates here. The next one coming up is uh, is August 16th, uh, and it's uh, it's from six to nine in the evening. Okay. Now, At the winery in Crozet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, yeah, they, they didn't put the winery on here. They, they, didn't, they didn't mention that you had to prepare yourself to be inebriated. But anyway, the, uh, and then the, the level two course doesn't say a list of dates. It says a starting date and a stopping date because it's a much more extensive, much more serious course of where uh, you, uh, you actually meet each week during that time period. Uh, basically, uh, about, I think it's six weeks, is that right? Uh, I'm bad at doing the math in my, date math in my head. But anyway, after, after that, you're actually a CERT member. Yeah. He teaches the course. Yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, what did I miss? <laughs> 
No, no, you're doing fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, we do about seven weeks. The last okay. is the is the final exam and and uh, uh, sewing it all up. But um, yeah, I've been I've been in search for about ten years now. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> I have a question. Does CERT have a separate amateur radio or communications section? CERT no. is a served agency of ARIES. Okay. So okay. they will call us in to do communications from you. Right. And, that, and that's why it's good to have some of the training because when you walk into the room, you want to see familiar faces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think this is where there are some growing issues that are unresolved, as far as I understand. Maybe Jeff has resolved them, but. Up yeah. to this point, I haven't heard a resolution, but um, people who are hands under emergency conditions, as they report through the ICS system, okay, are yeah. going to be assigned to work through that method. Right. Okay? The, the problem that exists is there are many hands who have real jobs, uh, right. some of which are fire, police, military type jobs. Right. Those people are going to have to do their jobs under emergency conditions and won't right. be necessarily available to service what ICS needs or what a CERT might need, and vice right. versa between CERT and ARIES. Yeah, so you have to keep in mind the fact that your resources that you actually can bring to bear may not be the same Listing of resources you have on your membership. Oh yeah, no that 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 yeah no that that goes without uh, without saying. And one of the things also is I mean I remember I said that right now in the Albemarle Charlottesville areas we have about 20 people that are signed up. Okay, does that mean that there's 20 people available all the time? That does not. Uh, when we had the uh, the communications emergency where they cut the fiber optic cable and we had to man the fire stations and things like that, we were able to do that by dint of having people do 12-hour shifts, which is not really what we want to do. We want to do eight-hour shifts or six-hour shifts or three-hour shifts. The more, you know, many hands make light work uh, uh, type of thing. And there was also one fire station that in the middle of the night we didn't have a person for, and that, that was not a, 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 this was when the emergency was winding down, so it was less serious than it might have been, but we definitely are, are we're not overmanned, let's put it that way. Okay. That's why we have mutual aid uh, agreements in place for areas as well. We can go national if we need to. That's yeah. when they would come to me and I would go up to the state level and they can go out to the national level and we call areas members in. <clears throat> so our roster may be small, but we have a big pool nationwide to draw from. Um, we can put the word out. It may take time to get them in here, right. but you know that's what we have to do. We have to really commute people on our areas rosters, and then go up to the rosters that are at the state or national level. Yeah. John, is there Aries? Are you doing recruiting for Aries and training and certification? Well, the or and, and is this. Or you start off and start, I'm really confused. Well, no, no, well, let, let, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Let, let's, uh, I, if I don't get to it, get, uh, remind me about it. I will say that there's also ARRL training, okay? In addition to ICS and, and CERT training, there is also uh, actual ARRL training. Strangely enough, this stuff isn't free. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of this uh, the, the EC 101 course, and that's about a $50 course to, to take that one. And it's a, it's a fairly extensive course. I think they say about 45 hours to finish it. Yeah. I was blessed. When I took it, there was an agency that reimbursed me. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, if you, please, please send me the name of this agency. <laughs> anyway, the, so there's also the ARRL offers things as well. So let's talk a little bit about Virginia Aries. Okay, this is the, the organizational chart for, uh, at least in the emergency operations plan for the Virginia section. Does this look at all familiar to you? Okay, it's basically they stole the, uh, the ICS chart. They broke some of the, they, they, the other one listed a liaison officer here. They list all the specific organizational liaisons. But basically, this is the same chart. 
Okay, that's that's the ICS chart is seen seen there. And now here, the operations section is more in terms of running uh, these these Odin nets, old the old Dominion emergency net. Okay, these are are nets that are not simply VHF, UHF nets. These are, uh, are typically HF nets, and uh, some of them CW, some of them digital, some of them uh, 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 voice. And right now our main liaison for those is, uh, is, uh, is Jeff there. Uh, but that's an area that, uh, that maybe we should be thinking about doing a little more and not for those little emergencies that were down in the lower side of the graph, but for those big emergencies that were up in the, the upper part of the graph. Uh, now, one of the things that always comes up uh, or, or maybe should come up uh, when we're talking about it is, uh, is professionalism. Because one of the things is that amateurs, uh, we, we cherish the freedom. We're amateurs for a reason. If we wanted to get paid to do this stuff, if we wanted to have a boss telling us how to do it, we would probably be you know, employed at a radio station somewhere. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the emergency services organizations, they pride themselves on professionalism. And there's nothing that a, that a ham, there's nothing in that definition of a ham that rules out a ham being a professional. So you can be an amateur professional, provided that you've got that skill. Yeah, the, the skill, good judgment, and polite behavior. Those are, the, those are the key things, okay? And that's skill with radios, and maybe that skill with some of the other emergency services uh, uh, or knowledge about how emergency services works, that sort of thing. Um, there's some no-nos out there, okay? One of them is do not self-deploy, okay? Big hurricane rolls into the area, you've never signed up with Aries, and, but by gosh, you're gonna go out and you're gonna set up a station that's gonna help everybody in your vicinity. Probably not a good idea, okay? A couple reasons for that. One of them is that you may actually, you, you will be adding to the confusion. You're gonna be operating on repeaters that are, maybe you have other uses assigned for them. Uh, you're not gonna be coordinating your efforts. You're gonna have nobody who's gonna be sending you any relief. I mean, that's a big part of the, uh, the ICS is making sure that they're, you know, nobody gets sent out there just for 24 hours at a time. There's always somebody there to replace you. John, I know we're running a little yeah. long, but I have to interject. Yeah. When I was in Alaska for 14 years, I worked with search and rescue. And number one, that do not was our, was our biggest challenge when we went on rescues in Alaska. Everybody with a snowmobile or a four-wheeler or an Argo or an airplane wanted to self-deploy and bring back their buddy their son, their friend, you know, whatever. And we had more, we spent more time practically rounding up everybody after we either found the person or recovered the body, then we ended up with two or three more people out there that we had to round them up. And that, that totally caused a lot of problems over the decade that I spent doing search and rescue in Alaska. It was a big problem because it's, it's personalities and people have this, a, a genuine, personal interest uh, sometimes in an emergency situation. Yeah. So, so it takes discipline. <laughs> right, yeah, no, well anyway, that, so, so the thing is before you, well, first of all, if you think in the case of an emergency you would like to participate, the time to sign up with Aries is earlier rather than later. It's get the training so that you're, you're actually prepared to participate should it come. And if there's an emergency and for some reason you, have a, you need to take care of your family, you have a job, there's some other reason, that's okay. Okay, that's, that's you know, being signed up for Aries doesn't mean that Aries overrides every important thing in your life. Okay, it's a, it's a choice for particular deployments. Uh, the other thing also is, uh, is like I said, that uh, uh, there is part of, an important part of the system is actually having formal traffic, actually having the ability to, to transfer those word by word messages. And so uh, there are certain tasks under uh, the ICS that actually are required to be as formal messages. You don't want somebody just sort of saying, 
oh, well, I, you know, I think you should send out 12 police cars. And no, it needs to be an explicit order to send out 12 police cars. Uh, phonetic alphabets, uh, we, we talk a lot about sort of phonetic alphabets. The big thing I wanted to, to emphasize was that these were not done just by accident. They actually set out not a list of what the phonetic alphabet should be to 31 different companies, countries. They sent out phonograph records because they wanted to make sure that, that not just for English, but also for non-English languages, that the different uh, terms in the phonetic alphabet would be understandable. Okay, so, so that's why we emphasize using the standard alphabet. Now, one of the things you, some of you may have picked up is I, I said that these are the, the ICAO, not, and then I mentioned some of the ITU. We usually talk about ITU phonetics. But uh, one of the things that's sort of interesting, I went to the ITU website, and it turns out that this is the way ITU says we should handle numbers. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody say this is KK4, CARTE4, uh, uh, or, or, or KK, CARTE4, uh, Juliet Hotel Papa. Uh, or, or, or Julia Papa there. Uh, uh, so they basically have made something that's, uh, again, sort of a more multilingual sort of thing. So we tend to use what would be uh, the, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization that was the one that originally came up with the list. We tend to use just sort of the regular numbers. But I, I came across that and I thought it was sort of an interesting. Well, that's, the, that's the numbers that we don't use. These are the numbers we don't, we, well, we don't use, we're gonna just use the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, uh, we might throw in niner, but that's about as far off as we're going to get from the, the regular things. But, the, but if you ever hear one of these, this is actually the, the official ITU list. Never heard that. I, 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 I never heard it, and I don't really think I want to push it. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'm very sure I don't. Anyway. Uh, well, I've never talked to an Italian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been still been trying to figure out what the, what even language that was. Now that's rare to get. Anyway, one of the, the challenges for Aries is that, that right now there's a lot of competition out there, okay? For you know, it used to be that for public service events you needed amateur radio operators to be there because you had no way to communicate. Now everybody's got a cell phone, and cell phones work in a lot of places. They don't, certainly, they certainly don't work when you have an emergency because what happens then is everybody uses them and once you get 10% saturation, the whole network goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, the, you know, the internet, well, we actually, the, the, they actually expect the internet to play an important role, though that virtual, uh, Emergency Operations Center. <laughs> uh, but that's, again, competition for us. That's something that might have been used uh, radio again. Uh, the, the local inf the communications infrastructure, we saw the, the presentation from the ECC folks, and they talked about all the levels of stuff they've got. Uh, so if we want to you know, be playing an important role in emergency communications, we need to bring something to the table that, isn't, that is missing. Uh, and it can't be that we're the group that's the hardest to deal with, <laughs> which they're, they're in, the, in some of the training exercises, they talk about the fact that somebody said that they would rather, have a, they would rather herd cats than have to deal with ham radio operators. I'm hoping that they ran into a bad batch of ham radio operators. So it's certainly not ones that, that, that have been, been trained. But having those, those elements, uh, uh, you know, the flexibility, obviously, that's improvisation is something that we can probably do better than any other, other group there. And, uh, and that's just sort of the example from the, the, the recent uh, one there. So uh, that's, that's sort of my question for you, is, uh, is, is what role should Aries play and what role should you play in Aries? For those of you who aren't on the 20-member 
list. Can I ask someone, what is a prerequisite for joining or applying? Uh, basically, you uh, fill out the application, and then once you filled out the application, we would very much like you to go and take some of those ICS courses online so that you're prepared there. The FEMA courses. The, the, the FEMA courses, and then also participating in the Northern Piedmont Emergency Net on Thursday Do you night. Think one of these days you might put out an all club email summarizing this? Cause yeah. I wasn't taking notes, and we only have a fraction. Well, we, video, we videotaped it. Right, but I'm just saying if yeah. you just put out a short, concise email. Yeah. Defining Aries, recruiting members. And a web address to go to, to register. Yeah. Right, do you okay. Do maybe include the application, if, or do you do it online, or is it a Yeah, there, there's, ba there's basically, there is an online system, but I'm actually going to defer to Jeff in terms of the, in yeah, terms of the, the details. The District 3 website um, yeah. is up. And you can go there, and there's a, a form that we set up that you can type your information in and send it. It'll come to me, and I'll send it to the EC for whatever jurisdiction okay. you live in. Uh, Chester helped me set up the website, and um, they'll work a little bit with uh, Mike, and we may change it over from the current D3 website and change some things around. But that's ariesgcva.us. Okay. So you can include that link in your. Yes, no, I'll, 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 I will add that. Uh, I will add that to the email, and I did uh, did throw together sort of a little bit of a list of sort of my some of the things I'd like to like to sort of see some more stuff on. But that's but that's my list, and I want you to be thinking about your list. Yeah, I'd like to offer to this club the fact of the ARRL training uh, on ICS. Um, Jeff and I are. The, two of the three trainers in Virginia. Okay. So we are capable between us to do stand-up training for those things on behalf of ARRL. So okay. if that's something that this club would like, then we can talk to you about it. That would be an excellent idea. Yeah, no, that, 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 that definitely sounds good. There was somebody else that had a hand up? Well, I was just yeah. going to comment. I mean, uh, some of us have emergency power, you know, big generators and you know, with a fixed station that can be an emergency node just like that right. uh, for HF and, and DHF without having to go anywhere. Right. Um, and, I mean, do you guys have a list of people like me and others that have one? Well, they, care? they have a title for it. AWRL does recognize that fixed stations, and they call them uh, emergency, I forget their exact title, but... Um, their emergency stations, but they're registered with Aries as well. Um, you need to be registered with your local EC um, to have anything to do with Aries because that's the central point um, where all communications and, and, and developing teams and, and training and everything, we have to coordinate that uh, through the EC. So the, the days of, of not being on a register, the, being registered with Aries and then coming out to work an incident uh, are pretty much over. If you come, if you're not part of Aries before the incident, you're probably going to sit in a volunteer registration area for many hours waiting to be deployed, if you're deployed at all. So, like like he said, now's the time to be part of Aries, get the training, and then you avoid that whole process. Yeah, the, the, the other thing, thing also is also making sure that you have the information that you need. Like, for instance, you have all of the radios and the antennas, but do you know what frequencies and what modes the different Old Dominion emergency nets are going to be run on? Are you, you know, in on the plan for, for an emergency? And that's the, that's the sort of communication that's facilitated by having you on the list and having you sort of, sort of ready to go. And we do need HF stations to be liaison with uh, the state. BFC. Right. Yeah. Uh, Is this list stabilized? I don't know how many times I've signed up with Aries and later found out that the list is gone and I got to do it over again and over uh, again and over again. And it's is it stable now? Yeah, yeah it will be stable. Um, I'm I'm having all the ECs in our district uh, go ahead and clean out the roster of people that, that don't want to participate anymore are going to take it down when we want. Um, you know, Dave started this whole thing of, of, of quality over quantity. So we're looking for quality people. We're going to cut the, the fat, so to speak, 
and then we're going to build the teams up from there. So we need people that are serious about helping out. And if it's, you know, you can participate as much or as little as you need to or want to, depending on your family issues and, and things like that. We don't expect you to put, you know, 20 hours a week. And um, you can be in a, you know, as long as you show up on occasion for a public service event or that the club does or um, an Aries training event or something like that, as long as you're active somewhere, we can keep you on the roster. And yeah. As long as you have those two classes um, right. from FEMA, and uh, we can go from there for training. Yeah. And then the, and the other thing also is that I, I would like to sort of get the communication working a little bit better in terms of the fact that some of you may have some really great ideas about things that we could do to prepare that you'd actually be willing to take leadership of. Uh, that's that's the, the, the key thing is I, 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 have, I have great ideas, but I don't know that I can, can necessarily convince you that they're great ideas, but I'm willing to have you convince me. I'm much easier to convince than you are, I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> anyway, uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, leave it. That's, the, that's it. So hey, thank job, you for your patience. Guys.